Good afternoon, welcome to the UK Column News. It is the 10th of July 2014 and it's just gone one o'clock. Uh, my name, um, uh, myself, Are you Louise Collins. No, not really. Louise Collins, Brian Garish and Mike Robinson are here in Plymouth and um, I'm not with it because it's really stuffy in here again yeah. and no air. What's it doing outside though? Uh, well, it's uh, sort of sunny, a bit drizzly at times. Um, we've got a report, Cornwall is, I've lost it now, cloudy and sunny in uh, Cornwall. That's about as much as I can give you today. But Louise is right, it's pretty hot in this studio. So it's also getting hot for um, Obama. And of course, this is a subject which the BBC and the main mainstream, so-called mainstream press in the United Kingdom simply do not want to report. What can you tell us, Mike? Well, indeed, because it's their stooge, of course. And, uh, well, Obama continuing problems uh, over the, the possibility of impeachment. Uh, and, uh, well, it seems like the Republican Party aren't quite going for impeachment on the floor of the uh, of the Congress at the moment. Uh, in the meantime, they're supporting uh, Boner's lawsuit, lawsuit against Obama. So he's bringing a lawsuit. Uh, basically, Obama, as we've mentioned uh, um, many times before, is absolutely subverting the rule of law in the United States, just as Cameron is over here, uh, and people are getting more and more irate about it. So I believe that this is an attempt by uh, by the uh, House leader, uh, Boner, to, to really um, uh, avoid an impeachment situation on the on the floor of the House. Uh, and so he's attempting to take uh, uh, a political, uh, sorry, to take a, a lawsuit out against Obama. Um, so uh, some quotes here. Uh, Representative Peter King told the Huffington Post that he believes that the lawsuit is a very reasonable step to take. Uh, we believe the president has been violating the law and going around the law. And so um, they're going to put this into a court with a corrupt judge uh, because that's the right place for it after all. No? Well, pretty similar system to uh, UK or maybe the same system driving events in America as well as many people believe. Well, back home, of course, our faith is in King David. Yeah, well, he doesn't want people striking and uh, he's going to announce a crackdown. Uh, today, National Union of Teachers go on strike over pay and pensions. Along with the teachers striking, council and health workers, firefighters, civil servants will also down tools. Cameron spoke out yesterday saying the time had come for a threshold in the number of union members who need to take part in a strike ballot for it to become legal and that a Tory manifesto could support a time limit on how long a vote in favour of strike action would remain valid. Uh, Cameron told MPs that he doesn't think strikes are right and people should turn up and get on with their work. And uh, big old Boris seems to support Cameron over all these strike actions. But I know Mike has a lot more on this. Well, well not a lot more, but before no. we move on, did you say something about a threshold there? Apparently so. A threshold? What, what threshold was there? Uh, what threshold was there when he was elected? Yeah, yeah. Very Good small point, one, yeah. right? So, so he requires a higher, a higher threshold for people to take strike action uh, than he required in order to become prime minister. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, well, uh, I really wanted to highlight uh, this report here, this article here, which is an opinion piece by Grant Shapps, a Conservative MP, of course. Uh, disrupting disruptive school strikes should be declared illegal, and he was having a real rant uh, about how children's education was really being damaged by this strike. One day. Well, one day of strike action, uh, as opposed to how many, uh, how many non-pupil days do, do pupils have to put up with? Uh, if he's arguing that a day off school is disrupting, uh, disrupting children's education, and really, uh, the point that I wanted to make here was, uh, the teachers should be entitled to take action if they feel is necessary. But at the end of the day, it's not teachers' action which is resulting in falling educational standards. And really, for me. Uh, one of the things that, that sort of highlights this is uh, if you go back to, to what children were reading uh, in, in the 19th century uh, and look at the text density and look at the, uh, the, the standard of the language that they were, that they were reading, if you go back to uh, the, the pamphlets that were used to organize people for the American Revolution and look at the text density, look at the standard of the language that they were expected to read, and this was uh, considered to be for mass consumption, uh, and look at the standard of reading and the standard of literacy in uh, 21st century Britain and 21st century United States, and then ask the question, has, has, have the standards of education in this country got anything to do with teachers going on strike for one day? I don't think so. So I think Grant Shapps needs to get uh, to wind his neck in a bit and, and wise up. Uh, but let's just remember what this is really about. 
uh, I will not let you destroy our, dis- our edu- children's education. That's my job, says David Cameron, and uh, that's absolutely the case, I think. Yeah, and we should also remember, of course, that Michael Gove was the uh, the man saying, well, we don't want an investigation into, uh, a pro- proper investigation into paedophilia in the establishment and Westminster. So if we look at who's got close to our children, many of them very unsavoury people, and uh, there is growing evidence which simply says the objective has been to dumb down uh, children in Britain in order that uh, it's easier for the ruling elite such as Mr Cameron to do his stuff. Um, We'll continue to report on that. Um, So finance then, a bit of good news from the United States, 600,000 people signing a petition for 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act. This is in support of the uh, legislation being brought forward by uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, And uh, and so, you know, what can you say about this? People are demanding uh, bank separation in the United States. They recognise that banks are still too big to fail. In fact, too big, uh, you know, they're even bigger uh, than they were in 2007. Uh, and they recognise the fact that bail-in seems to be the policy of the day. And so they are absolutely demanding uh, that uh, Congress act on this, uh, and good to see that happening. It's a pity that we're not seeing the same uh, momentum building behind this uh, Glass-Steagall and the Bradbury Pound over here, but that's up to us to organise. Um, but uh, less good news for the financial sector, at least, uh, is uh, the fact that yet another J.P. Morgan uh, Banker has committed suicide. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, he actually shot himself after he shot his wife. Uh, and he, this was not just a, a sort of uh, uh, tell attendant. This was, he was a senior banker for JP Morgan. Uh, he uh, had worked for JP Morgan for several years, uh, most recently as executive director of its Global Network Operations Center. And prior to that, he helped, held various positions with JP Morgan Chase and other companies. So yet another person uh, from J.P. Morgan uh, committing suicide. How many is that now, Mike? Do you uh, know? I don't know exactly how many, but it's, the team, it is the certainly, team. yes, absolutely, yes. But it's all a coincidence that these bankers are suddenly committing suicide. Nothing to see, no reason for it. This is just part of normal life. Got to ask what is going on within J.P. Morgan, and uh, perhaps uh, this gives a hint, um, because here we have uh, another bank about to go under, uh, and this is the Portuguese bank Espirito Santo, uh, and it has to be said that uh, uh, Espirito Santo's uh, creditors are extremely concerned that there's going to be a bail-in over this. Um, so uh, the, the central bank has assured uh, creditors that uh, that they are protected, but of course they don't really believe that. Um, bank shares tumbled more than 14% today, and its bonds dropped to record lows. Uh, should the por- Portuguese situation continue to deteriorate, this is according to Adrian Miller, Uh, of GMP securities. Should the uh, Portuguese situation continue to deteriorate, uh, risk aversion contagion could quickly spread to other Eurozone member states, bonds and other asset classes. So another demonstration that they have done nothing to sort out the financial system. They've done nothing to fix it. Uh, It's still as bad as ever, if not worse than it was in 2007. And I'm just going to say it again, 2007 was not the main event. It was merely a pre-shock. Uh, The main event is coming. They know it's coming. They intend that it should come. Uh, And uh, that's why I'm pleased to see 600,000 signatures on a petition for Glass-Steagall in the United States. We should have the same pressure coming to bear in this country quickly. Indeed. Well, what's happening in UK at the moment? Of course, the subject is many people are finally waking up to the fact that uh, we're being governed by liars, cheats, uh, criminals and paedophiles. And uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, the truth is beginning to bubble up to the surface and we're seeing the panic in the faces of our senior politicians. But it's also interesting to watch what is actually happening in the mainstream media. And of course, it was the BBC that stepped forward to uh, start to attack Mr Dickens, the original ME, um, MP, who uh, started to release uh, files, the dossier, the Dickens dossier, on paedophiles operating in Westminster and the British establishment. So sort of thing we can expect from the BBC, but very interesting to see that the uh, Express here is now able to tell us that the paedophiles are also operating in the British Armed Forces. Yeah, they are. Uh, According to the Express, a freedom of information request has shown that army personnel are being arrested at a rate of one every fortnight for downloading child pornography. 
47 soldiers, sailors and airmen have been referred to prosecutors since 2011 with 21 convictions to date. Within that uh, same time frame, 39 personnel have been arrested for rape and sexual assault, with seven being convicted, and approximately 20 have actually been allowed to stay back in post. So what do you think about that, Brian? Well, I think it's very interesting that uh, one of the papers has actually delved in with a freedom of information uh, request to get this information out. Of course, we're, we've got to be realistic about it. Problems do go on in the armed forces. But how fascinating that just at the time the spotlight is coming on, not media people, but Britain's politicians and members of the establishment and their activity in paedophile rings. So all of a sudden we get the yep. spread sideways. No, no, we're going to have a look at the armed forces. Well, Mike, if you'd just be kind enough to bring that one back on screen for us. Let's also remember that it was the British government that approved Satanism. Uh, for use in the armed forces. This was the BBC report. Of course, they'd be keen to report Satanism, uh, saying that a, a warship in Plymouth, I think it was HMS Campbell, um, they had decided it was OK for one of the sailors to do uh, satanic ceremonies on board. And this has set the precedent for British armed forces. So this is to do with government policy on what happens in the armed forces. Could it just be that as a result of government policy, uh, which clearly appears to be pro-paedophile at the moment, we've now started to see this spread into the military? However, we are going to say, let's clean up the mess in Westminster first, and then we'll see what needs to be done with uh, Britain's military, with the people who at the end of the day are putting their necks on the line uh, in the front line. And uh, we've got a bit more to do yeah, with the paedophiles here. Quite a lot more, in fact. A lot more, yeah. Uh, the Independent are focusing here on the desperate measures families are having to take back in Cambodia just to survive. The article here focuses on a 14-year-old girl called Danae, who at the age of 10 was sold to British paedophile for $750. Um, uh, Michael Leach, uh, who was a former, actually, Ofcom worker and government advisor, um, who is actually now serving 12 years in prison, uh, kept Danae locked in a bedroom for days at a time. The selling of virginity is currently rife in Cambodia, uh, with uh, many police corruption, uh, corrupt police uh, being involved with all the uh, selling similar, of the children. Bit similar to Britain then. Exactly. So uh, exactly. the paper's pointing at Cambodia, saying, "My goodness, this is disgraceful." But we got yeah. the same thing happening. The in thing Britain. is, in Cambodia, the parents are allowing it to happen just to purely to survive, but they're being bribed with money because they can't feed. Yeah. their families so the only option they're having to do is sell their daughter's virginity to um, to escape and here's the story that originally came out about here's Michael Leach this is the gentleman who little Danae was sold to um, and as we say he is now serving and, time in prison and the BBC can get its noses into uh, Cam Cambodia, Cambodia here Cambodia, so yeah. trust the BBC we're not going to look inside our doors but we are going to report on everybody else's uh, every exactly. everybody else's problem so this really leads in to the fact that uh, the establishment is beginning to creak in Britain. Yep. OK, so uh, Terry Shute, who was a detective constable with Mess Mercy of Police and involved in the 1992 arrest of social worker and Pi founder member Peter Wrighton, which here he is there, um, he's spoken out about letters um, that were found at Mr Wrighton's home that uh, had links to establishment figures, senior clergy members, and according to Mr Shute, the letters were investigated by many important leads and they were not followed, followed up and that uh, covering up for the establishment was far more important than um, looking into the paedophile ring that was going on at the moment, that was going on at the time. Yeah, so what's the British government doing about things? Well, aside from using NSPCC, which we reported on yesterday, uh, of course, it's this lady that's uh, suddenly become the focus of attention. I apologise for the photograph straight out of the telegraph. Um, so um, the Home Office has apparently been ordered to hand over more details of what's been going on um, as the titles of the 114 missing files well, this is all nonsense, isn't it? Documents quite clearly destroyed, hidden. And uh, now we're having a little bit of a, oh, who's got the missing file? Do we even know what the name of the missing files was? This is a pure smokescreen, of course. And many people believe that if you look this lady straight in the eyes, this is exactly the person who has been brought in to help the government cover up its uh, yeah. dirty little secrets. 
Well, some people say this lady comes uh, from a legal dynasty. She's the priestess, effectively, and the key man, Sir Cecil Havers. And he happened to be the judge in the trial of the last woman to be hanged in Britain. We'll come back to that in a second. But here we are, daughter Elizabeth Butler Schloss, former president of the family law division. And um, many people believe her to be the head of the female Freemasons in Britain. Now, we're not sure whether that's correct. Perhaps somebody could tell us, but that's the allegation. So that would make her a high priestess then? I believe um, that will put her somewhere in that bracket. Okay. So uh, the big man, head of the dynasty there, Cecil, um, well, he made a substantial error, according to many press reports in the trial of Ruth Ellis. So this lady was hanged, um, but he made sure that uh, the jury didn't see information as uh, pertaining to how she had been treated, which led up to the circumstances where she uh, murdered a man. So um, it's the usual thing. We've got to trust our judges because they're infallible, uh, apparently. And uh, don't worry about juries because they're a bit of a nuisance. So um, Elizabeth uh, Butler Schloss in the press for making errors during uh, an investigation into abuse connected to the Anglican Church. Uh, Cleveland, uh, many people allege that uh, there was a warning that went to the Parents, don't speak to the press or you'll lose your children. Um, and then, of course, in the 7th of September 2006, she was apparently made deputy coroner of the Queen's household, a very important job which led nicely into her initially chairing the Diana inquest until June 2007 when she handed over to Lord Justice Scott uh, Baker. I don't know whether you need want to comment there at all, Michael. Well, of course, the reason she handed that over to him uh, was because she had attempted to run that inquest without a jury. Uh, she'd been taken to judicial review by uh, Al Fayed uh, because he was demanding a jury inquest. Uh, and when he won that judicial review, uh, she felt that she had to resign from that uh, from that inquest because uh, she didn't really know how to handle juries. Yeah. Mm. Well, she's a judge, so I mean, she wouldn't really understand juries or the fact that actually they have the job of making decisions in court. Uh, but um, anyway, some um, um, interesting progeny. Nigel Havers, the actor. Um, we've got an, um, another son. Philip has also Queen's Council. Sorry, I catch up with myself. Um, and then we've got Michael Havers. And this is the, the man connected with uh, the case around Sir Peter Heyman, the paedophile diplomat. And uh, apparently there's been some scandal for the husband as well, Joseph Butler Schloss. And according to the Internet, at least the News of the World front page, uh, News of the World, I think this is front page on the 17th of July, uh, 1988, was making allegations about some sexual sleaze. So it's the usual story. Trust us. Uh, this was the BBC reporting on the fatal errors made by uh, Cecil Havers. And at the end of the day, this lady went to her death with the jury having been denied critical information about why she did what she did. Welcome to justice in Britain. But if this lady's coming under pressure, um, she says she won't quit. No, she won't quit. Well, as, as everyone knows, we, we don't know what each, each other's are. Stories each other, one of each of us are covering. Um, but I picked up on this um, this morning. And obviously another Baroness, they're always there somewhere. Uh, former top judge Baroness Butler Sloss has been picked to chair Theresa May's inquiry uh, into the paedophiles in Westminster. But Simon Danzig MP has uh, spoken out and uh, thought the scandal and brought this into the public domain. And uh, he's saying he has concerns over the appointment of Butler Sloss by saying she has a conflict of interest as her brother, Sir Michael Havers, was Attorney General during the 80s at the height of the scandal. Echoing Mr Danzig's concerns is Alison Miller, a lawyer representing some of the victims. Uh, Sir Michael Havers, father of actor Nigel Havers, came under fire back in 1980 after attempting to stop the late Geoffrey Dickens, the MP who originally gave the dossier to, to Leon Britton, and uh, he, he came under scrutiny because he didn't want him naming Sir Peter Heyman as being a paedophile. Amazingly, dear old Baroness Butler Sloss uh, knew nothing about her brother's involvement in this. And uh, I found this article well, from the 1980s, which we should have. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, that came up and it actually it came from Ottawa Citizen. I couldn't find it on any old UK press, but I did find it on uh, the Ottawa Citizen 
where um, it is explaining so about uh, Heyman's involvement. She doesn't, she makes mistakes, she doesn't know about juries and she doesn't really know what her brother is up she to. Knows, she had no idea about her brother being involved back in the 1980s, even mm. though he was within the government. Right, okay. Well, um, we'll follow it through because we have another little bit of the story here. This is uh, Michael Havers. Um, Conservative, former Attorney General, Lord Chancellor, and this is to do with a spy case um, around a guy called Geoffrey Prime, uh, was working for GCHQ um, and uh, been involved in the military as well, and he was busy passing secrets to the uh, Russians. And it then turned out he was involved in Pi as well. Well, as the text says, um, uh, excuse me, in a written reply to Dickens on the 15th of November 1982, Thatcher denied that Geoffrey Prime was, should be a Pi member. I understand that, sto that stories that the police found documents in Prime's house or garage indicating he was a member of the paedophile information exchange are without foundation and nothing was discovered to suggest he was. That was reported in The Guardian on the 16th of November 1982. And in 1983, The Sun reported that Geoffrey uh, Prime had been a Pi member and that angry Americans were convinced that the Attorney General, Sir Michael Havers, had held back from mentioning this to avoid embarrassing security chiefs. Sir Michael Havers then complained to the press council and his complaint, surprisingly, was upheld after The Sun failed to produce any evidence of their claim. Um, and the Daily Star then followed on. So um, here we are, but material m uh, disappears. We don't want to embarrass anybody, particularly the security services, and um, he can uh, he can appeal against I think complaint. it was, um, well, it's, it's her son called Michael as well, because it's her yeah, brother. Yes. My story was on the brother. Yeah. Well, so the son's called brother, the it, son's Michael as well. It's, it's confusing here, yes. I have to say. There are a lot of them, so there may have been a slight error here. We will check this after the programme. Yeah. But as we say to people, please research yourself and double check um, what, we are, what we are saying. Um, the articles in relation to those individuals are correct. So um, here he is. Here's the man who's speaking out, Simon Danzuk, MP. And um, here, as uh, Louise indicated, these are some of the things he's saying at the moment. Eight months after a report was published, Lady Butler Schloss had to issue a six-page addendum in which she apologised for inaccuracies. Uh, which she admitted arose from a failure to corroborate information which was given to her by senior Anglican figures as part of the inquiry. So you're put in charge of an inquiry in a senior position as judge and you forget to do your mm. checks. A bit more to follow on that one, Mike, if I may. And this is the other bit. David, sorry, Downing Street said, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, stood by the appointment of Lady Butler Sloss after it emerged her late brother was accused of a whitewash over a paedophile case. In the early 1980s, Sir Michael Havers, then Attorney General, was accused of a cover-up when he refused to prosecute Peter Heyman, a diplomat. She commands the very highest <coughs> respect for her professional expertise and integrity, Mr Cameron's official spokesman said. She's, do you know who's coming to mind after reading this and who she reminds me of? She's another, like, Lynn Homer being moved in just to, to, to mess things up. I mean, this is... Well, mess up is a bit unkind, yeah. I think, is to smooth things to smooth over. smooth things over and, yeah. mess, and mess things up as well, I think. Yeah, <laughs> both. Yes. And um, if there's anybody out there not convinced about the credentials of this woman, well, go on YouTube where you can watch her making an apology in the House of Lords for making false allegations uh, that she received death threats from Fathers for Justice. So you can hear her again saying, well, I wasn't properly prepared and I was a little bit mistaken and uh, I'd like to apologise. I did apologise to fathers, to fathers for Justice because they didn't actually make any death threats. Oh, she was looking a so, bit wobbly back then. I mean, you know, now age kicks in and what have you. And I mean, she could I, be making a few more mistakes and could be forgetting a few more. Things. I think that we should put her in contact with uh, Lord Faulkner. That's a good idea. Because um, Lord Faulkner believes that when you get a bit doddery and you don't really know what you're do doing, in a minute. then uh, you should be eased out gently. So we'll put them in contact and yeah. see if, if they can <laughs> both put them up. resolve each other's problems. 
So that brings us nicely to the BBC and um, well thank you very much whoever did this. Somebody posted a very very interesting one minute not the nine o'clock news uh, clip on YouTube. We're not allowed to play it because that would make us television like and we will have uh, Atvod crawling all over the studio. But um, this is part of the opening scene. This is genuine material, not the nine o'clock news. And uh, it shows um, figures stealing children, kidnapping them. And when they've kidnapped the children, the children are bundled into a lorry. And when the lorry drives off, this is what it says on the side. So we are going to say, um, concerning Jimmy Savile and the rest of the paedophiles. Did anybody know inside the BBC? Apparently not. Well, they absolutely did. There we are. BBC covering up, government covering up, but also, I believe, the uh, Foreign Office. Uh, yes, because uh, it's not just uh, dossiers relating to paedophilia that uh, are going missing. Uh, the Foreign Office has been accused of a cover-up uh, after ministers... Um, well, this is records of flights passing through an overseas territory used by the US. And of course, where are we talking about? Diego Garcia. And this is to do with rendition flights. And apparently the documentation over these rendition flights, which may be of use to a future inquiry, um, have been lost due to water damage. Uh, and as you said earlier, Brian, perhaps that's because they were sitting beside the tables as, as people were being waterboarded. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they have been lost uh, due to water damage. At least in this case, they know what happened to them. Yeah, yeah but yeah, water, water damage is a good one, isn't it? Does that mean somebody took them to the toilets and they were washing their hands and they mm. splashed them? Or did they flush them down the toilet? What we've got here is a pack of lies from successive governments. Governments involved in criminal activity, fiddling of expenses known to ordinary people as stealing, uh, paedophilia, starting wars overseas, and uh, if we need to do a little bit of torture to help things along, then we're going to do that. But of course, we need to destroy the evidence, um, in this case, water damage. Maybe yeah. they were put in a waste paper bin outside in the park somewhere and it rained on them. Uh, what you're not suggesting, as, as um, our Tory friend um, and with that, his name goes out my mind. I'll come back to that. But yes, I know the one you're talking about. It was the Sun that reported it. Well, there are many, many good people out there. And um, this gentleman seems to be doing some useful stuff at That's the moment. Really Zach Goldsmith. Many people are surprised at this. We're going to watch him closely. Uh, but actually, our praise uh, went to this gentleman, Michael Murrin. And he's been writing emails to many people. This is the one to Mr. Goldsmith. I've, I have had information passed to me, which I've not verified. I'm asking you to look at it and come back to me to advise as to its veracity. I have been told that Dame Butler Sloss was the chair of the highly secretive Cabinet Office Security Commission up until 2005. I understand that the role of this commission is to examine what actions need to be taken in the case of leaks in security in government organisations. Is that right? I further understand that steps are being taken behind the scenes to shred security service archive material related to paedophile links with politicians and the security service role in the use of paedophilia for the purposes of blackmail and, in particular, the control of politicians. If the information concerning Dame Butler Schloss is correct, then is it credible to expect her to act impartially in her proposed role in investigating child sexual abuse linked to the political establishment? Your very early response would be appreciated. Yours sincerely, Michael H. Murrin. Well, this is just the sort of stuff, in our opinion, that's needed uh, because it's taking the battle straight to the desks of the politicians and many people believe, and I certainly believe, we are starting to see the cracks in the establishment. You will begin to see these people uh, breaking ranks and uh, squealing in order to s save themselves. So the more pressure on the MPs, the better. Uh, thanks to Mr. Murrin's email, we did a little bit of homework on the Cabinet Office and we came across this document. Uh, remember, Francis Maud is the Minister of Transparency for King David. And so this is probably straight out of his empire. Cabinet Office Public Bodies 
2010 and we went and had a look for the security commission and we found it is vacant nobody at home so the terms of reference for the commission to investigate and report on the circumstances in which a breach of security is known to have occurred in the public service and to advise whether any change in security arrangements is necessary or desirable the security commission was originally established by the prime minister in 1964 during 2009-10, the Security Commission was under review and appointments to the body lapsed. The Minister for the Cabinet Office announced on the 14th of October 2010 that the government had decided that the Commission should be abolished. Keep it on screen there, Mike, because we've got a bit more to add. But quite clearly, the government seemed to be aware that there was a little bit of um, trouble coming. And so we need to get rid of the very body tasked with dealing with leaks and of course Mr Murrin's question was it Butler Schloss who happened to be chairman seems to be very pertinent but they've uh, also got other panels here's the security vetting appeals panel and um, this is to do with appeals against the refusal or withdrawal of security vetting uh, if people are unsure about security vetting that's when the secret services delve in your background to make sure you haven't been naughty by drinking too much, womanising, or toy boys, or prostitutes, or cocaine, all the good things they do to make sure that you're a trustworthy person. Clearly they don't get involved with the Westminster, but Sir George Newman does earn £785 per day in order to check the backgrounds. Oh, perhaps he doesn't. Uh, gobsmacked. Well, of course he does, because otherwise how could they blackmail people? Well, this is true. Mm -hmm. So we better bring up the last of these committees we'd like you to have a look at. And uh, here it is on screen, the Committee on Standards in Public Life. And we were just intrigued to find that uh, the gentleman there at that stage was Sir Christopher Kelly, um, getting a mere 50 grand per annum. And we believe it's the same man who just happened to be the, the then chairman of NSPCC. So we have a nice little circular situation developing where uh, we have NSPCC people who were apparently there to look after standards in public life, uh, but their team is now being put on charge of committees looking at paedophile activ activity with people uh, who should be looking after standards in public life. Who's in charge now, do we know? To look at who's in these positions now uh, well we the gentleman who's in the seat at the moment is a banker so um oh well it's good news here is he is oh well dear. yeah the new nspcc chairman uh here he is and it's mark wood and axa and he's big in insurance uh, but he's he's been very keen on the work of nspcc for many many years so we are highly suspicious of what's happening with NSPCC and their people put in, put in charge of independent inquiries. Uh, we think there's, I think it's known as a dog's breakfast here. And uh, why would this occur? I think it's to do with drips. Well, indeed. Uh, this really demonstrates how desperate these people are, um, because this is the Data Retention and Investigation Powers Bill. Uh, and this is emergency legislation, and let's just see what Cameron had to say about it. It's the first duty of government to protect our national security and to act quickly when that security is compromised. As events in Iraq and Syria have demonstrated, uh, sorry, demonstrate now is not the time to be scaling back on our ability to keep our people safe. The ability to access information without communications and intercept the communications of dangerous individuals is essential to fight the threat from criminals and terrorists targeting the UK. No government introduces fast-track legislation lightly, but the consequences of not acting are grave. I want to be very clear that we are not introducing new powers or capabilities. This is not for this parliament. Uh, this is about restoring two vital measures, ensuring that our law enforcement and intelligence agencies maintain the right tools to keep us all safe. I'm not sure who David Cameron thinks us is, uh, but what this boils down to is that they are claiming uh, that the European Court of Justice struck down regulations enabling the com uh, communication service providers to retain communications data for law enforcement purposes for up to 12 months. So unless they have a business reason to hold the data, internet and phone companies are required to start deleting it, which has, they say, 
Uh, the, the government, that is, they says it has serious consequences for investigations, investigations which can take many months and which rely on retrospectively accessing data for evidential purposes. And the other point that they're making is that, uh, that the law was unclear and so the service providers, providers themselves were asking for clarity. So all of a sudden, how many days after this paedophile scandal breaks, we now have the situation where emergency re regulation is being rushed through Parliament with all party support to continue the snooping agenda on, on people. Yeah, yeah and, and apparently the snooping is pretty useless because they snoop, but they don't seem to pick up that there's paedophile traffic going around between people in yeah, positions amazing. that affect Britain's security. So it's getting quite confusing because we're spending billions on uh, facilities at GCHQ. We're able to, uh, supposedly the state is able to monitor millions of uh, emails and telephone com conversations an hour. But when they monitor them, they don't actually seem to be able to detect anybody that's doing naughty things with, with children. It's yeah. confusing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's but, right. But, but we, just keep in mind that we're completely safe here because this bill includes a termination clause that ensures that it, that it falls at the end of 2016 so that the next government, whoever that might be, if there is a next government, um, will have to uh, look again at, at the bill and see whether they want to continue it. See how to keep us safe. Um, we'll just remind people it was Jack Straw, of course. They got uh, somewhere in the region of 400,000 uh, secret services files on troublemakers and subversives in Britain uh, destroyed. Uh, why would you want to do that? Maybe because you're running the subversive program yourself. Uh, well, do we trust King Cameron? Mm. Um, no, not at all. Now, last week, that's, this slide isn't relevant to it, but that last week we did mention that uh, Cameron, as, as a result of the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, is intending to bring the whole uh, business of Magna Carta back into schools and teach our pupils, our school students, uh, all about Magna Carta. Uh, and, uh, well, this is absolutely, we warned that this has probably got to be seen in terms of the the constitutional reset that they're attempting to bring through at the moment, this constitutional reform agenda that's been going on since 2010. And this uh, slide really uh, is typical of, of it because this is from 2012, I believe, uh, where Cameron was calling for a new Bill of Rights, as if the current Bill of Rights wasn't good enough. Um, so, of course, in 2010, Nick Clegg was given the task of running the constitutional reform agenda uh, and Scottish independence as a part of that. A House of Lords reform, which failed so far, is another part of that, although there's been quite a lot of House of Lords reform over the years. Um, well, it seems that the, uh, the agenda is right on track because the Commons uh, Political Reform Committee has become a public consultation on what they're describing as Britain's sprawling mass of constitutional law. It said a, a written constitution one of th was one of three possible options that could form the basis of a new settlement, a reset perhaps, uh, as well as a fully written constitution, they are suggesting two other options for discussion. A constitutional code, which would be a document sanctioned by Parliament but without statutory authority, which would set out the essential elements and principles of the constitution and the working of government. And the other possibility is a constitutional consolidation act, a piece of legislation that would consolidate existing laws of, of a constitutional nature, the common law and parliamentary practice. Uh, and uh, Graham Allen, the Labour MP who chairs this committee, has said we are living through a p period of considerable democratic change and upheaval, as if that's something that's happening by accident. Uh, so this is an extremely dangerous development. Uh, they intend to replace the uh, rights, liberties and principles upon which this nation is founded. They intend to replace the common law. Uh, and I think that's absolutely clear if you look at the uh, history of the constitutional reform agenda. Uh, but the other thing that I just wanted to highlight uh, was this little article in the Telegraph? Our liberties must be given, must not be given away lightly. A written constitution will create more litigation and require the judiciary to pass judgment on the authority. Uh, sorry, on the constitutionality of legislation. Now, um, while I, uh, I mean this, this article is mainly about the HMRC story that we covered yesterday. Uh, and what I really wanted to say to the Telegraph here is that while I agree with much of the sentiment that's in this article, I absolutely take issue with the notion that our liberties must not be given away lightly. They must not be given away at all. Uh, and in fact, we should be fighting tooth and nail to reclaim the liberties that, that have already been taken from us. Uh, and uh, and we got to reverse the drips. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, 
we go now? Uh, well, solution, I think, is uh, the one that should come up here, which is oh, I do the apologize. British Constitution oh, Group. Of course. So I'll just remind everybody that the British Constitution Group is still there. It is still operating. It does need more support. It needs more people getting active. Um, and so if you're not aware of, of it, uh, please uh, get in touch. Uh, you can get in touch through the contact form on the website. Uh, and John or Justin will be in touch to, to uh, in contact to see what you might uh, get involved with. But please get involved because uh, this is the most probably the, the time that the British Constitution Group is needed most uh, when there's such an attack coming on uh, on the Constitution, on common law, and uh, and they're attempting to overlay this European style of governance and, and in fact United Nations style of governance on us. Uh, we need uh, we need the principles that this nation is founded upon reinforced, reasserted, not reset. Yeah, well, we just reinforce that point. If anybody is talking about reset of any uh, anything to do with the country, if it's reset, as far as we're concerned, it's on the other side. The term has now been taken by the One World Government Brigade. Uh, if you if you see or hear reset being used, uh, you can safely assume safely assume you're looking at the other side bringing in its agenda. They'd like to get rid of us, and oh. they want us to forget. Well, they do. Uh, Professor Theo Boer, who is a veteran European watchdog expert on assisted suicide, has admitted he was wrong to support euthanasia. The assisted dying bill is due for its second reading in Westminster next week, and uh, that would allow doctors to prescribe poisons to terminally ill and mentally ill people. Uh, but Professor Bauer said uh, he takes a very different view now as euthanasia is now becoming so prevalent in the Netherlands that it is becoming a default of dying for cancer patients. Um, here's the figures, yeah. Um, he said that deaths have increased around 15% a year since 2008. He continued to air his concerns by highlighting that there was an ex extension into the scheme to include demented or depressed people getting onto the assisted dying list. So this, this is the um, Nazi agenda. Look, if you're mentally ill, you're disabled, you can't work for the state, well, we're going to help help you go through a system. Exactly. And, and I of mean, course, look at the rise in the figures. If we can have that slide back up, Mike. Look at the rise in figures and, and what it is now. Apparently 2013 figures aren't available, but it's right up there. Over 6,000 um, assisted suicides going on in the Les Netherlands at the moment. Um, the figure shows that today the Netherlands, um, almost one in seven deaths are at the hands of doctors over there. And, uh, well, who knows what's going to happen if the bill is approved in Parliament. It's second reading next week. I think they go through four, don't they? Three or four readings before they get passed. Well, unless they don't need to bother with that at all That's and true. they just sort of bring it in. It yeah. So Just very, very quickly. We're going to get one. our brains uh, we are. scrambled. Barry Everett uh, is a Cambridge professor in neuroscience, and he told the Federation of European Neuroscience that his research um, in, in, in rats had found that targeting memory plas placidity in the rats, um, he was able to reduce the impact of drug memories and that his research could offer a new method of treating drug addiction. Uh, the research showed that when drug memories are reactivated, they enter an unstable state, and by obstructing a brain chemical receptor, they can erase the memory. They also found they were able to weaken drug use memories by altering particular genes. So, so this who is knows, it's just messing with the heads, transhumanism and all the rest. It's, it's not nice. It's, it's not nice. OK, well, we're going to end on a good note and um, we're just going to come back to the power of uh, the written word and we'll bring you back to Mr. Murrin, who had actually sent another email to Mr. Goldsmith, MP. Many thanks for your response to my email. I'd also like to make known to you that I am investigating over six reports of subversion and suppression of police investigations by the intervention of the security services, the Office of the Attorney General and the Prime Minister's Office. I have one verified report confirmed by a senior former police officer. Uh, I spoke with him personally. I have further reports which came via the civil service. I spoke with the source personally. These are not second-hand reports. From where I'm sitting, the inquiry set up by Cameron looked to be uh, designed to cover up and suppress the allegations concerning senior politicians. I'm also investigating a report of suppression of a criminal charge against a senior judge which is relevant to current events. 
I state again that if the corruption within the political establishment is not dealt with now, then this society will collapse. I trust that you, Mr. Watson, Mr. Danzuk, Mr. Hemming and like mining parliamentarians will not shrink from your duty to properly represent the interests of the people you represent and the wider interests of this country. I'm totally serious about this and I will in due course produce a report detailing every allegation of corruption that I have received. I will name names and stand by the report. It will include allegations of drugs money having been used as a bribe to change government policy, the corruption of the Office of Attorney General 1980s and the corruption of the Office of the Prime Minister. Many of these allegations are historic but are relevant today. I will, whatever the financial cost and whatever the personal sacrifice I have to make, see this through. I will do so not because I'm pursuing a political agenda, nor because I'm a subversive. I will do so because this country cannot go on like this. Corruption corrodes democracy. The real subversives are those in positions of power who engage in it. Yours sincerely, Michael Murray. Nice. So Michael gets our vote. This is exactly what's needed, which is action by every adult man and woman in this country to take on the liars, cheats, uh, criminals and paedophiles who are running the country. Mm. So there's still some politicians who think potholes in the ro road are the most important subject. Um, I think we've shown today that's not the case. And before we finally finish, a mention for Robert Green, of course, the campaigner trying to protect <coughs> children against abuse and, of course, to obtain justice for abuse victim Holly Gregg. Uh, Robert Green is still under house arrest in Warrington. He still has not had any full and proper trial. He still does not know the charges against him. Uh, but I can tell you that on the 16th, of this month, uh, there will be a hearing in Scotland, which is now apparently to decide whether there should be any further proceedings against him. And we'll report on that in more detail next week. And if I've got the statistic right, uh, Robert points out that since 2010, when he was first arrested by the police for trying to protect children from abuse, he has now had to report to a police station more than 200 times. So if you're a politician, a lord, a senior judge, member of the establishment, BBC, or BBC, you can be out there committing the crime of paedophilia and child abuse, and nobody comes near you. Robert Green, under house arrest as a result of trying to protect children. It's pretty easy to see what's going on. Um, now, Mike, are we... Are we producing a prob program tomorrow? I think the answer to that is not. Uh, no, uh, we're going to take a day off tomorrow. Apologies for that, but uh, we've got other things that we've got to get done. Uh, and so uh, we'll be back on Monday. Can I just say next Friday at uh, Westminster, there is a child abuse rally organised by an incredible woman called Mumsy. And they'll be outside uh, Westminster House of Parliament from about 11 o'clock, I think they're meeting um, up near Nelson's Column around quarter to 11, but then they're going to go down to Westminster. And again, it's very peaceful, just handing leaflets out, raising awareness of what's going on in the big house and uh, and around the, around the government. So that's next week. Uh, OK, we'll, we'll get that. We'll get that up. I have the to forums. fly her up next yeah. week. Yeah, okay. next Friday, 11 o'clock. OK, well, we'll leave you from a very hot studio. If you think that Louise was hot today, I'm going to tell you I was pretty hot as well. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.